Proverbs chapter 1, a wisdom book in Scripture, probably the most prominent wisdom book in Scripture. And yet amidst all the wisdom that is contained in the book of Proverbs, there's also a good bit of confusion. Confusion about how to understand individual Proverbs and then confusion about how this book as a whole is to be understood. We live in a day where the most common question that we not only constantly ask, almost anxiously ask, what is God's will for my life? This, this is prevalent across the church today. That is a constant question. How do I know God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? And talking here about things that are not spelled out directly in Scripture. Scripture says specific things about specific circumstances, but there are so many circumstances we face, some of them small, some of them big, on a daily basis that the Word doesn't speak directly to, whether it's what we eat or what we wear today, um, small decisions like that, big decisions like who to marry, what career path to choose, where to live. How do we know God's will in these areas of our lives? Obviously, Scripture speaks to those, all those things in some way. Scripture talks about taking care of our body, and that's going to inform the way we eat or honoring God with the way we dress. Or Scripture's going to speak into who we marry, and that Scripture tells us not to marry an unbeliever or what career path to choose. So there's immoral career paths that you should not choose according to Scripture. But when it comes down to the details of what this looks like, we want to know what God's will is. Our hearts desire God's will, but we have a hard time transitioning from our hearts to our minds and making decisions. We're afraid, almost constantly afraid that we're going to do the wrong thing, that we're going to make the wrong decision with different situations we face. And we just wish we could have it spelled out right in front of us. It would make it a lot easier. But if that were the case, it would miss the whole point. And so what I want to show us today in Proverbs, in this book as a whole, is a picture of incredible comfort and incredible confidence that you can have when you're walking through decision-making processes, when you're walking through decisions that you make on a daily basis. Incredible comfort and confidence that you can have that you are living out and following the will of God based on the picture we see in Proverbs. So what I want us to do is I want us to read the first seven verses here of Proverbs. They're kind of an introduction to the rest of the book. They tell us the purpose of the book. Proverbs is divided into two major sections on a whole. First nine chapters are kind of a preface to the book, talking about wisdom, giving us reason why we need to read the rest of the book, because wisdom is valuable. We need to get wisdom, treasure wisdom. We see that over and over and over again in these first nine chapters. Then you get to chapter 10, and from chapter 10 to 31, what you see is different proverbs, different wise sayings. A lot of them two-liners, three-liners, maybe four-liners that are written to be memorable, lodge away in your, in your mind and in your heart, that take the Word and apply it to practical things that we face in our lives. Most of this written by Solomon, not all of it. Other parts written by different folks or at least compiled by different folks, but most of it's written by Solomon. What I want us to do is I want us to look at these first seven verses that give us a purpose statement basically for the entire book and then focus on one particular verse that's going to guide us through our time in Proverbs today. So we'll start in verse 1, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I want you to underline that last verse, verse 7. Key verse. All throughout these, these first seven verses, we see these words used almost interchangeably. Wisdom, instruction, insight. 
prudence, knowledge, discretion. And then you get to verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. ESV says, some translations say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. In fact, you turn over to chapter 9, verse 10, which is getting near the end of this first major section, and you see this verse repeated again. It's kind of bookended. Look at Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You might underline it there. That's that's, this is the memory verse we've had this week as we've been started reading through Proverbs. This is the verse I want you to etch in your mind this morning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I want us to think about the relationship between the fear of the Lord, between worship of the Lord, and wisdom. And I want you to write something down at the top of your notes that's not in there, but... I want to encourage you to write it down because it's going to be kind of a guiding truth that we're going to come back to at a couple of key points. So write this down somewhere at the top of your notes. Wisdom is the fruit of a right relationship with God. It's basically Proverbs 1, 7, reworded a bit. Wisdom is the fruit of a right relationship with God. Wisdom springs from, results out of, right relationship with God. When we walk in fear of the Lord, in worship of the Lord, we will walk in wisdom. Our wisdom in daily decisions is dependent on our relationship with God and having a right relationship with God. And this makes total sense when you think about it. Think about it in light of what we have been doing over this last year. We've been reading through the story of Scripture. Go back to creation with me. you got this in your notes. Think about Genesis 1 and 2. We saw man in complete harmony with the Creator. Genesis 1 and 2, before sin sin entered into the world, Adam and Eve in complete harmony with God, perfectly relating to God. And as a result of that, we saw man in complete harmony with the creation. In complete harmony with each other, Adam and Eve. We talked about that last week in Song of Solomon, which I am glad that sermon is behind us. I got the, I got the kindest note from a sister in our faith family who wrote me a note and thanked me for that message. She and her husband last week, this couple in our faith family, was celebrating their sec- 62nd wedding anniversary. Like. 62 years of Song of Solomon. That's good. So that's the picture we had in Song of Solomon, Genesis 1 and 2. Man and woman in complete harmony with each other, not just with each other, but with the world around them as a result of their harmony with God. And that was the picture. They, they weren't wandering around saying, what is your will for our lives? God had made it clear. Don't eat from this tree. Enjoy one another. Enjoy me. Be fruitful and multiply. So, okay. They were living in harmony with God and with each other. So it wasn't a worry. Am I going to make the wrong decision? It was clear. You know what happened. They take the command of God and they disregard it and results in the fall. And the result of the fall, twofold. Man's relationship with the Creator is destroyed. Were it not for the grace of God, they would have been dead on the spot. And man's relationship with God since that day has never been the same. Never. But not just man's relationship with the Creator destroyed, but man's relationship with the creation distorted. Their relationship with each other was immediately affected. And their relationship with the world, with creation around them, was immediately affected. And it makes sense. Once they were disconnected in their relationship with God, it had a huge effect on everything around them. What I want you to notice here is there's a vertical component and a horizontal component here. There's a vertical component, our relationship to God, with God, that has a direct effect on the horizontal component, our lives in this world, our relationship with other people in this world, our decisions that we make on a daily basis living in this world. All of that flows from what's going on in our relationship with God. There's a vertical component that affects the horizontal component. We see that. So the picture is, in order to have a right relationship with the world around us and to walk with wisdom in the world around us, making wise decisions, we need a right relationship with God. Wisdom is the fruit of a right relationship with God. So now we come to Solomon. And this is what I love about how we are reading the Bible this year. 
Because we have a tendency to take a book like Proverbs and just picture it like it's just kind of floating out there as its own book with all these random sayings. But what we're doing is we are seeing where Proverbs fits into the story of redemption, fits into this picture of redemptive history that we're walking through. And so a couple of weeks ago, we got to 1 Kings chapter 4, and we stopped in redemptive history, and over the last two weeks, I've been reading Song of Solomon and Proverbs. So what I want to do is I want us to take us back to where we stopped in redemptive history. Turn back with me to 1 Kings chapter, we'll start in, in 1 Kings chapter 3. I want us to look at 1 Kings 3 and 4 to remind ourselves of what's going on when we come to the book of Proverbs. What's the background? What's the history behind this? This book didn't just appear out of nowhere. I want us to hear where it came from. Look at 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 5. We read the parallel version of this in 2 Chronicles 1 uh, a couple of weeks ago. But you, you might remember what happened. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. So ask whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon, he begins to pray. Just go down to verse 7. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of David my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. So here's what he asks for, verse 9. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this your great people? So he asked for an understanding mind, for wisdom. And it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I will give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall rise after you. In other words, he says, I'm going to make you wiser than anybody before you and anybody to come after you in this picture in the Old Testament. You are going to be the wisest. And that's exactly what we see. Go over to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. This is the last paragraph we read before we pause to go into Proverbs and Song of Solomon. Remember what it said. Verse 29, 1 Kings 4. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure. And breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than, and it lists some guys, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of fish. And people, listen to this, of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. So that's where we stop. Now it makes sense why we stop to read Proverbs at this point. Verse 32 says he spoke 3,000 Proverbs. That begs the question, what do they say? What do they say? And so that's why we're stopping to read Proverbs now. But what I want us to see is I want us to basically take this book of Proverbs and put it right here in this context in redemptive history. Because what's happened is Solomon has become king. He has asked for wisdom. God has given him wisdom beyond that of anyone else. And right after this, what we're going to read in the week to come, starting in verse 5, what Solomon does is he starts to build the temple. He makes preparations to build the temple. In chapter 6, he builds the temple. In chapter 8, he dedicates the temple, which is what we're going to talk about next week. But here's why, here's why I want you to see this. What I want you to see is, a, is the relationship here in the context of redemptive history between wisdom and worship. Because at this point in redemptive history, we are at the height, at the apex of wisdom and worship in Israel's history. The wisest man, the wisest king ever. 
The temple being completed, that which David longed to do, but God reserved for Solomon to do. It's being completed, where the glory of God is going to dwell among his people. This is at a point in history, redemptive history, where in the Old Testament, wisdom and worship are coming together like they have never come b- together before, and why, like they will never come together again in the Old Testament. This is the apex of the mountain. So when you think about this, look in your notes, redemption anticipated in Solomon. In the reign of Solomon, we're seeing two things. Number one, God-centered worship at the temple. That's what's going on historically here. And we're going to not spend a lot of time talking about the actual temple because we're going to do that next week. But just like Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 9, verse 10 said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The wisdom of Solomon is tied to the worship of Solomon. His relationship with God affecting his relationship with each other and his wisdom with other people and creation around him, the wisdom he is showing. And so when you look in Proverbs, what you realize is this is not just a book about wisdom. This is most definitely a book about worship as well. You see exhortations all over Proverbs to revere the person of God. At least 18 different times we see the fear of the Lord mentioned. Fear the Lord. Revere the Lord. Respect the Lord. Stand in awe of the Lord. At least 18 different times. And this is where wisdom starts. It's a spring from which wisdom flows. Revere Him as the almighty creator of all things. I'm going to throw out some different verses. We don't have time to turn to all of them, but just random verses in Proverbs. Chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. Proverbs 14, 31 reminds us that the Lord is our maker. He is the one who formed us and fashioned us. He is the one who created us. This is where wisdom starts, with an acknowledgement of God as our creator. This is why You can take the most brilliant atheist in the world today with all kinds of intellectual knowledge and Proverbs and Psalms and the rest of Scripture would label him a fool. And it's not because he doesn't know anything. He has tons of knowledge. There are a lot of smart atheists. But the The reason he is a fool is because all of his knowledge is viewed through a perspective that is godless, that denies the existence and the truth and the reality of God. And as a result, the lens through which he views everything in the world is ultimately empty. That's foolishness. It may look like wisdom in the world, but it is foolishness compared to the wisdom of God. Wisdom springs from an acknowledgement and a reverence for the Lord as the almighty creator of all things. Wisdom starts with worship of God as creator. The Lord is not only the creator, he's the sovereign sustainer of all things. Chapter 16, this is all over chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Verse 3, commit your work to the Lord, your plans will be established. Verse 9, a very common verse, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You may make plans, but the Lord is the one who establishes your steps. Verse 33 in Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lap. It's every decision, though, is from the Lord. Chance does not rule. Man does not rule. God rules. God reigns over everything. He is the author and the sovereign sustainer of all things. He is guiding, leading all things. All times are in his hands. He is the sovereign sustainer of all things, and the Lord is the eternal judge of all peoples. He is the eternal judge of all peoples. A just and balanced scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. Proverbs 16, 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 21 says, Be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished, but the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. All throughout this book, we see different things the Lord hates that are an abomination to the Lord and the reality that God will judge all peoples ultimately. This is is cause for fear. You, right where you're sitting at this moment, 
were fashioned and created by the infinitely wise, all-powerful Lord and King over all creation. And He holds your days in His hands. You may make plans, but He guides. And one day, He is going to judge you. That, that gives us pause. That brings about a holy fear for the Lord. And this is the spring from which wisdom flows. We revere His person. We rejoice in His grace. So we continue on with this picture of the Lord and worship in Proverbs. Proverbs 3, verses 3 through 6, talking about the steadfast love and faithfulness that God gives and the verses that are very common known to us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He will make your path straight. Proverbs 28, 12 says that when we confess our transgressions, we receive mercy from God. Even His discipline, Proverbs 3, 11, and 12, is evidence of His love for us. So we see as we re- revere Him, we rejoice in His grace, we receive His Word. Proverbs is filled with instructions to heed the word of the Lord, hear the word of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13, whoever despises the word brings destruction upon himself. He who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. We receive his word. It's part of wisdom. Wisdom springs from his word. And we remember his purpose. Picture throughout Proverbs as we see the way God acts and the way God displays his character, the way God reveals his glory. And that's what the temple was all about. This whole worship life of the people of Israel. It was about revering Him, rejoicing in the grace He gives, receiving His Word, remembering His purpose to make His glory known in all the world. All of that is spread throughout Proverbs. So what we see, the time when these are being written, is God-centered worship at the temple, which leads to, second, God-given wisdom for the king. We've got both these together. God's in worship at the temple, God-given wisdom for the king. And the height of wisdom is displayed here in all of these Proverbs that we have written down. Now, how do we understand these Proverbs? Just to give an overview of what we've got in these 31 chapters. What we need to remember, first and foremost, and you've got this in your notes, this is huge. Proverbs are guidelines for living, not guarantees in life. That's big. When you read through Proverbs to realize these sayings, particularly chapter 10 through 31, they're guidelines for living, not guarantees in life. Really the whole book. You, here's what I mean by that. You look at chapter 3, verse 2, where it says, If you obey the commandments of the Lord, then you will have long days in this life. Okay, that's, that's a good guideline for living. But the reality is, when you look at David Brainerd, Robert Murray McShane, Henry Martin, missionary to India... All of these brothers who were giving their lives in radical abandonment to the commands of Christ died in their early 30s. So it's not like a a steadfast, well, if you obey the Lord, then you're going to live past your early 30s. In the same way that you see at one point, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 8, says the righteous man will be delivered out of trouble. That's a general guideline, but we know we have persecuted brothers and sisters all around the world who are pursuing righteousness right now who are not being delivered out of trouble. Now, it doesn't mean the Proverbs aren't true. It doesn't mean they're all false. What it means is that's not how they're supposed to be interpreted as promises to claim. Like, this happens. This is like a lucky charm. You pull out, claim this one. It's going to be that way every time. That's not the way Proverbs are intended to be interpreted. Instead, what we've got is general guidelines for living, for our lives, that are very helpful. We need to remember these kind of things. They're patterns, but they're not promises that we claim in every single circumstance that we face in life. Guidelines for living, not guarantees in life. And what I did in your notes here is I wanted to give you an overview of just some of the recurring themes. This is by no means exhaustive. But I want you to just kind of see, get a feel for some of the themes that we're seeing over and over and over again in these sayings in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs puts a lot of focus on the family. Exhortations in two main areas. One, to love your spouse loyally. 
There's a little bit of flavor of Song of Solomon in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 through 19, where husband and wife encouraged to enjoy one another sexually and emotionally in love with one another. You see in Proverbs chapter 6, at one point, a husband's jealousy for the affections of his wife is looked at as natural and good. Obviously, we have in Proverbs 31 a picture of a godly wife, a godly woman. Some of the most intense passages in Proverbs come in this area with warnings against adultery. Chapter 2, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 9 all have stern warnings, the kind of warnings that I think we would be wise to meditate on regularly. More important than even reading marriage books in our culture would simply be I just want to, I don't want you to look, I don't want you to turn here. I just want you to listen to this with me. Just, just meditate on this for a second. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 6. At the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple. I have perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense. 